Welcome to Let's Talk Micro. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Micro. I hope you had a great week. As always, Let's Talk Micro is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Overcast, Amazon Music, Pandora. Whatever you listen to your podcast, you can find Let's Talk Micro. I am also on Instagram as Let's Talk Micro, no apostrophe, and on Twitter as Let's Talk Micro 1. So go ahead and follow. I always like to post pictures of organisms and always promote the episodes. So go ahead and follow. So this is actually the last episode of 2021. After this, we'll come back with more episodes in January. So let's do a brief summary about the last episode, right? So I started going over on how to identify staff warriors on the bench. So this is from your standard setup of cultures, right? No chrome auger. So basically your typical wound, respiratory sample tends to have blood, chocolate, McConkie, anaerobes depending on the source, and PEA. So I talked about how to identify staph aureus from these plates. So I talked about colony morphology, staph aureus colonies, they are flat, large, and most times they have a yellow pigment. As far as biochemicals, they are catalase and coagulase positive. I went over those as well. If you haven't checked that episode, go ahead and do so. And also check episode 6, where I talk more about catalase and coagulase. And I also went over the Abbott Clearview PVP2A SA culture colony test. This is a qualitative in vitro immunochromatograph immunochromatographic assay for the rapid detection of penicillin binding protein 2A, which confers resistance to methicillin. It is a very simple test. You add two drops of reagent 1, which is blue. Then you add a heavy inoculum of your well-isolated colonies. Next, you add two drops of reagent 2. At this point in time, the sample goes from blue to clear. You insert the test strip in the tube and you wait five minutes. This is a very useful test in rapidly identifying MRSA before susceptibilities are performed. Right, so this aids the physician. They want to know proper treatment, proper contact precautions for the patient. And also, as far as us in the clinical lab, we can use this test to refer cultures to one another, right? So I went over on the previous episode about how to refer cultures, you know, if there's the same source, typically within two to three days apart, then you can go ahead and perform susceptibilities on one and refer the other one to the one that you perform susceptibilities on. In the case of staph aureus, if your first culture was an MRSA or an MSSA, which is methicillin susceptible staph aureus, you perform this test. And if it matches, if that second culture matches to the first one, then you don't need to perform susceptibilities and you can refer. So if you wanna hear more, Go ahead and listen to the previous episode where I talk more about it. So this test is a great way to identify MRSA before doing susceptibilities. So now that we know about this, you know, we have the biochemicals down. We have this test. Now let's go ahead and talk about agar. So I want to talk about chromogenic agar and then um, mannitol salt agar, which is not chromogenic. So we'll talk about three different types of agar today, or media. Two are chromogenic, and one is not. So let's start with the first one, right? So this is such a significant organism that patients undergoing surgery get screened for it, right? You want to make sure that since patients, you know, people are colonizers, you want to make sure that the trauma of surgery doesn't cause the organism to gain access to sterile sites. So typically, if the patient is going for surgery, they get screened until they do an MRSA screen. And also, you can use this for healthcare workers, too. So by now, you have heard me saying many times chromogenic agar, chrom agar. So let's start with defining what chrom agar is. 
So chrome agar or chromogenic agar, it's a type of agar that it's made so that the targeted organisms, they produce a certain color on it, aiding in their identification. There are many types of this, you know, of this agar out there. You can use them for like MRSA, VRE, which is vancomycin resistant enterococcus. And you can, there is also agar for yeast, right? Like Cantu agar, where Candida albicans is blue, um, Candida tropicalis is pink. And there's also agar for the identification of Enterobacterales, like different colonies, different species they produce different colors. So the first one that I want to go over is Chrome ID MRSA agar. And this one is made by Biomero. This is a selective and differential chromogenic medium. And we're getting technical here on going off the package inserts for the qualitative detection of nasal colonization of MRSA. This is going to aid in the prevention and control of MRSA in healthcare settings. So this test is performed on nasal swabs. So the sample is from the nares, either from patients and health or health healthcare workers to screen for MRSA colonization. Remember like we tend to be colonizers and we have different types. This agar can also be used for positive blood culture specimens. So as I talked before with blood cultures, right? It's flag positive. You know, you do uh, uh, you have a gram positive cocci in clusters, then you can use the blood sample for that. Well, typically you see it more perform on nasal swabs. So what's in the agar? It has different peptones. It also contains a chromogenic substrate of alpha glucosidase. Additionally, it has a combination of several antibiotics, including cefoxidine. Those of you that work in clinical micro know that you can use a cefoxidin disc to screen for MRSA or when you're having a, some conflict with the Vitec or you're getting a questionable susceptibility, you can use a cefoxidin disc. So this media has several antibiotics and has cefoxidin in it. And what do these components do? Well, the alpha glucosidase activity helps in the direct detection of MRSA. So this activity is seen by the appearance of green colonies. The antibiotics, which include cefoxidin, they favor the growth of MRSA, right? So MRSA is going to be resistant to cefoxidin, so it's going to grow on it. So overall, this mixture is going to inhibit most of the bacteria that do not belong to the genus Staphylococcus. This is a very easy test to set up, right? Just like any other agar. So you have your swab, right? You inoculate it on the agar. You do your streaking for isolation, right? Not quantitation, isolation. So you do the three to four quadrant streak. And then you incubate it at 35 to 37 degrees Celsius in a non-CO2, non-carbon dioxide incubator. You incubate it for 24 hours. Colonies that are, that are MRSA, they have a green color. And the package insert says that any shade of green is considered a positive result. Now, another question that arises from this is, what if we're not sure? Meaning, is it, is it staph oris that's actually growing there? Can other organisms grow? I mean, the answer is yes. The package insert says that other organisms can produce a green pigment, pigment and others can grow with or without the pigment. How do we confirm, right? from what we have learned from Staph aureus, catalase, coagulase, but um, can we do those on this, on this agar? And the answer is yes. You have a colony, you're unsure, you can go ahead and do catalase and coagulase on it. You don't have to sub it to a blood plate to find out if it's Staph aureus or not, or to perform those biochemicals. You can go ahead and do those biochemicals from that plate. But it's always good to do a gram stain since all organisms can grow. A gram stain is always, like I've said time and time again, is the most helpful tool that you can have. You know, you have uh, any questions about whether it's a staph aureus or not, go ahead and do your gram stain. It always saves time. It points you in the right direction. So it is one of the best tools that we have in the lab for us. And after all of that, if you are not, if you are unsure, 
Still, go ahead and sub it to a blood auger plane and go from there. So, but typically, you know, with all these components that the auger has, it tends to really inhibit the growth of a lot of organisms. So you don't get that many iffy, questionable colonies. But in, those, in the cases that you do, go ahead and use the tools that you have, what you have learned, gram stain, catalase, coagulase, and then sub to a blood culture, blood culture, blood auger plate, if you are still unsure. The next auger that I want to talk about talk about is BBL Chrome Agar MRSA2 from BD. So this is a selective and differential medium for the qualitative direct detec detection of methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus from clinical specimens. So there are uh, similarities and differences between this one and the Chrome ID MRSA agar that I talked about, that I just talked about. So, and I'll point them out as I go. So with this one, if, as far as the sources, the test can be performed on respiratory, lower gastrointestinal, the skin, wound specimens, anterior nares, and positive blood cultures. So there are more sources here. So with the, with the Chrome ID MRSA, you had nares and you had the blood cultures. And then with this one, it expands to GI, respiratory, you know, it has skin, it has also blood cultures. So there are more sources. So what's in the agar? Well, look, just like in Chrome ID, there is a foxidin, which MRSA strains are resistant to, therefore growing on it. It also has a chromogenic substrate. The hydrolysis of this sub substrate by MRSA strains Produces a mauve color. So this is the difference between this agar and Chrome ID. Here is mauve and in Chrome ID is green. So just like Chrome ID, it also has selective agents to inhibit the growth of other organisms, such as gram negative kind of yeast and other gram positive cocci. Uh, the package insert states that bacteria other than MRSA may utilize other chromogenic substrates in the medium, resulting in blue to blue-green colored colonies. Or if no chromogenic substrates are used, the colonies appear as white or colorless. This is all from the package insert. So you will set it up the same. Where you get your sample, inoculate it, streak for isolation, and here is for the differences. You also will incubate it 35 to 30, 37 degrees Celsius in a non-CO2 incubator. But the difference is the times. On the Chrome ID, you had, you incubated for 24 hours. So here is the difference. So for Nares, you incubated for 20 to 26 hours. For blood culture samples, 18 to 28 hours. And for other sources, you examine at 18 to 28 hours. And if you don't see any mauve colonies, you go ahead and incubate it for a total of 36 to 52 hours. The last agar I want to talk about is mannitol salt agar. So this is not chromogenic, but it is useful in identifying staph aureus. In this case, I am going over the BD BBL mannitol salt agar. Now, when I talk about these companies, they have no relation to this podcast. They're not sponsoring me or anything. This is just stuff that I gather and to talk about. You know, some of these I'm, I have, you know, I have worked with. Others I haven't. But there's no relationship between them and this podcast. I just want to make that clear. So Manitol Salt Auger is a selective and differential medium for the detection and enumeration of staphylococci from clinical and non-clinical specimens. What's in the agar? Well, it has peptones and beef extract, and these, they supply essential growth factors, such as nitrogen, carbon, sulfur, and trace nutrients. It has a 7.5 concentration of sodium chloride. So what does this do? Well, it results in the partial or complete inhibition 
of bacterial organisms other than staph. So this is the selective part. So the agar has the nutrients, and then for the selective portion, it has that concentration of sodium chloride, 7.5%, which will inhibit the growth of most organisms. What is the differential portion then? Well, in this case, it is mannitol, right? So the fermentation of mannitol, it's what's going to help differentiate between species of staph, right? So we have talked about fermentation. So when fermentation takes place, right, acid is produced, which changes the pH. So we have an, uh, an indicator in the agar. Can you guess which one it is? Phenol red that I have mentioned in previous episodes. So with phenol red, so the change in pH is going to produce a color change. So in this case, it's going to, a fermentation, it's going to look yellow on the agar. The setup for the sample is the same, you know, inoculate, streak, and then you incubate 24 to 48 hours in a non-CO2 incubator. So that's the similarity between all three of these, that you're going to incubate it in a non-CO2 incubator. And I know this is sometimes, it, it causes challenges in the lab, especially like if you're in a large facility that you have many plates, it happens. I think one of the most common mistakes is that uh, when either lab assistants or technologists, they are putting the plates away in the incubators, they might put everything together. Um, but you know, typically your wound cultures you incubate them in CO2, so they might put everything together. Sometimes, you know, they might forget or not realize that the mannitol salt needs to be separated. With the chrome agar, it doesn't happen that much, really, because normally you don't set those up as a set. You know, you just do the one plate. So that's easier when you're putting it away. But when you have these cultures that, you know, you have four plates, you know, blood, chalk, mac, PEA, and then you have anaerobes, and if you had a mantle salt auger, then it, it, the mistake might happen where it gets put in the CO2 incubator. So this plate, this mantle salt auger plate, is actually used on cystic fibrosis patients. You know, those they typically get, you know, that set of like cystic fibrosis sputum cultures, they get blood chocolate McConkey, and then they add a mantle salt auger. You know, Staphylococcus aureus is it's seen in patients with cystic fibrosis. So it is a good agar to use for that. So what do the colonies look like? Well, Staph aureus is going to produce yellow colonies due to, the, due to the fermentation of the mannitol. All the staph species that are able to grow on the, with the high salt concentrations, um, they're going to produce small to large colonies with red zones. And then other organisms such as strep or gram-negative rods, they can exhibit trace growth to no growth. So there we have it. We have three different types of agar that helps that help with staph aureus. So we have the Chrome ID, MRSA. We have the BBL Chrome Agar MRSA2. So these two are chromogenic. You incubate them in a non-CO2 environment. The incubation time is gonna change between the two because the chrome agar MRSA has different sources, more sources than the chrome ID, and it's going to vary depending on the source. Typically, the longer, the longer incubation times being the ones that are not from blood cultures or nares. So they have all three of this, this agar, they have components, you know, they have selective components that are going to inhibit the growth of a lot of bacteria. The chromogenic agar is going to produce color, for the intended colonies, Chrome ID producing green colonies, Chrome agar MRSA2 producing moth colonies, and on the mantle salt, Staph aureus yellow, others, uh, Staph species, you know, colonies with red zones. The Chrome ID, the Chrome agars, they're typically set up by themselves because um, you're doing some sort of screening, whereas your mantle salt agar is typically you see it the most when you're doing like cystic fibrosis patients. So it is part of a, of a set of agar for that culture, which is like blood chocolate, McConkie, mantle salt, 
and you can use Sepatia agar for buccal daria sepatia. So there you have it, definitely a very important media that we use to detect this organism that is so significant in healthcare settings. So we definitely need all the tools that we can have at our disposal to make sure we detect it, to make sure that the patients are okay, you know, the healthcare workers, make sure they're properly treated, all the precautions are taken. Because that's what it's all about, to ensure the best possible outcome for the patients. And that, my dear audience, is the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed listening about this agar, because I definitely enjoyed talking about it. I hope you enjoyed all these episodes of 2021 of Let's Talk Micro. You know, it's been great. I definitely enjoyed talking about you, about them to you, the audience. So please go ahead and subscribe. You know, leave me a comment. Give me, give me a review. Go ahead and follow on Instagram, on Twitter. You know, just go ahead and let me know. Uh, we, I will definitely be coming back in January with more episodes or some really good stuff coming your way. So, as always, continue bringing that motivation to work, that passion to what you do. Stay safe. Stay motivated. Go ahead and enjoy your holidays, your time off. If you're traveling, be safe. And of course, continue talking micro. See you next year.